This is the newsroom for Friday, December 5, 2021. We're broadcasting to you on E1, Scar TV, NTN, and Tarzi TV in Bartica. In the headlines, the sod is turned for a new state-of-the-art secondary school for Prospect on the east bank of Demerara. We want when you get into the classroom that you can access a quality education. Another COVID-19 death takes Guyana death toll to 180 as Ramadan in Region 7 remains a concern for the health authorities. An inmate of the Luzignan prison is beaten to death with a piece of brick. In tonight's feature, we highlight a local sushi chef who's making the waves. And in sport, overseas-based Guyanese journalist tips Guyana Jaguars to win Super 50 and drag racing to make a return on February 28. With the news, I'm Kurt Campbell. We're glad you can join us. First up, a new secondary school will be constructed at Prospect along the east bank of Demerara to cater for some 1,000 students. The school will be constructed with modern facilities, including a computer and science laboratories. Isanella Patwa reports. A sod turning ceremony was held on Friday at Prospect East Bank Demerara for the construction of a new state-of-the-art secondary school. Minister of Education Priya Manik Chan during remarks said the school will provide a comfortable learning environment and high-quality education. The construction of the school is made possible through an extended loan with the World Bank. Once completed, it is expected that over 1,000 students will be enrolled. We want when you get into the classroom that you can access a quality education, that you have trained teachers who um, constantly update themselves through our, with, our, with state resources to make sure that the education they deliver to you is relevant to the new and emerging economies across the world and that it is of such a high quality that whatever is delivered is received. So we started looking at quality in a very different way. And then we started simultaneously looking at universal secondary education. That means we want across Guyana, from the Paparimas Mountain to the Quarantine, to Maruka, wherever you live, that you should be able to access secondary education. Permanent Secretary Alfred King said the school will include a performing arts studio, computer and science labs, and a library. Here we are expecting not only to provide the educational space that will speak to a modern facility that will allow, that will allow for a balanced growth and development of students in the education system at the secondary level. Obviously, that would be the, one of the functions of the project given that it will be catering for not only the classroom or the traditional classroom spaces. Meanwhile, bidding is not yet available for the project, but contractors and consultants were warned of termination of contracts if the school is not completed within the stipulated time frame. While the construction cost is not yet known, the Prospect Secondary School will be similar to schools being constructed at Yarrow Cabra on the Suzai Linden Highway, Good Hope on the east coast of Demerara, and Parafit Harmony on the west bank of Demerara. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isanella Patwo. We tell you now that four days after he was remanded to the Lusignan prison on the east coast of Demerara on a charge of trafficking cannabis, 40-year-old Victor Samru was beaten with a piece of brick wrapped inside a towel. Director of Prisons Acting Nicolon Elliott revealed that on Thursday, February 4, at about 21.05 hours, an alarm was raised by prisoners housed in Unit 1 of the quarantine section. The officers in duty responded and it was reported that Samru was badly beaten while he was asleep by another remanded inmate. The director said Samra was immediately taken to the prison infirmary where he was seen by the medical personnel on duty, but he was later referred to the Torchung Public Hospital Corporation for further medical treatment. On February 5, 2021, at about 10.30 hours, Samaru died. He was housed in Unit 1 along with three other prisoners, including the suspect. Samaru previously resided at Gordon Street Kitty, Georgetown. Police are investigating the matter and the suspect has been relocated, according to the director of prison. Guyana's COVID-19 death toll reached 180 on Friday after the Ministry of Health announced the latest fatality, an 86-year-old man from Region 4. 
The ministry in a statement revealed that the patient died while receiving medical care at a facility. The patient is the third person to have died for February. Two deaths were also recorded on Wednesday, a 73-year-old man from Region 1 and a 54-year-old male from Region 4. We tell you now that Guyana currently has just over 750 active COVID-19 cases, with 44 of those cases being recorded in the small village of Ramadan in Upper Masaruni, Region 7. The government has been monitoring the village for some time now, but on Friday, Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony said it continues to be an area of interest. Dr. Anthony said with 44 active cases, a medical team continues to work in the area to treat and monitor patients. We have a medical team in the area and they would be going to uh, different parts um, in the Mazaruni uh, to not just check um, what's going on at Waramadam but going to some of the other villages uh, to ensure that um, persons in those villages are not positive as well. So that's work that is ongoing and of course in Region 9 while we have been relatively quiet in terms of our cases uh, because of what is happening in the neighboring state of Roraima. We continue to have very uh, close monitoring and um, we have established a system whereby we are constantly checking to make sure that we are not missing any cases. So right now uh, things are quiet or relatively quiet but it's an area that we have great interest in monitoring. Despite efforts to explore a possible resolution to the challenge against the Police Service Commission's 2020 promotion of police officers outside the ongoing judicial process, the court was told on Friday that no progress has been made. When the matter came up before Chief Justice Acting Roxon George on Friday, Deputy Solicitor General Deborah Kumar told the court that the parties were unable to resolve the matter despite Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs Anil Nandlal indicating the willingness of the Commission's Chairman, Assistant Police Commissioner Retired Paul Slow, to facilitate this. In the circumstances, she made an application for leave to file an affidavit in defence within 21 days. The Chief Justice had adjourned the matter until April 9, 2021 at 10 hours for clarification and directions and has given several timelines to serve and file affidavits in the matter. Justice Jarrett said in the meantime, the status quo of the Guyana Police Force should remain as it is until the matter is fully heard, ventilated and a ruling is handed down. When the newsroom returns, the Cyril Potter College of Education to offer online training for teachers and Guyana has to pay for 149,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccines from the African Union and CARICOM Pact. Stay with us. You're watching the newsroom. The Cyril Potter College of Education will have a fully online school to train teachers who cannot access its physical facilities, Minister of Education Pierre Manachan announced on Friday. When we came in, we had about 30% of our teachers trained in 1992. And by the time we left in 2015, it was hovering in the 80s, different levels, primary, nursery, secondary. So let's say we have an 80% trained teaching service right now. We still have a lot of untrained teachers in the classroom, and so very soon, I have great pleasure in saying very soon, and this is the first time I'm publicly saying it, we are going to be launching off at CPC, which is the Cyril Potter College of Education, a full online school. We don't mean teaching on the internet alone, Zoom. We mean it's a full online school with books and resources and you can register there and tutoring will happen there. And we hope to offer that service to our international um, friends, to our Caribbean brothers and sisters, to other people who want to be trained teachers and can do this online. So that the teacher in Kaikan right now on the border of Venezuela who is teaching and has been teaching there for eight years but can't leave there to come here to get trained at CPC, we will train her online. The teacher at Parima, again in Region 7, who wants to be trained but can't leave there, they're actually in a classroom, we will train them online. So instead of seeing 800 as our intake, we've already gotten about 2,000 applications for this year. A Carbon Airlines 
flight bound for Toronto, Canada from Guyana is now delayed due to mechanical issues. The newsroom was reliably informed that the 49 passengers and crew who were already on board at the Chetty Chagan International Airport are all safe and have been transported to the Princess Ramada Hotel along the east bank of Demerara. The newsroom understands that the flight was ready for takeoff at about 3 hours 30 on Friday when it was discovered that there were mechanical issues as such the passengers and crew had to disembark. It is unclear at this time when the flight will be rescheduled. Having offered local businesses free services to make them competitive in the oil and gas sector for the last three years, the Centre for Local Business Development recently wrapped up a five-day supplier forum. The forum provided well over 700 local businesses that participated with information on upcoming procurement opportunities in the oil and gas sector, helping them to make strategic planning decisions ahead of time. Director of the CLBD, Natasha Gaskin-Peters, told the newsroom that the businesses also benefited from direct interaction with ExxonMobil and its prime contractors about upcoming business opportunities. This week we would have hosted the supplier forum and this forum is really gauged towards you know, engaging the local entities, providing procurement forecasts to them from ExxonMobil and their prime contractors so that they can begin to make those strategic investments in their company. But we would have had over 700 plus local companies that participated in the forum. On day one, we would have launched the videos that were pre-recorded from ExxonMobil and their prime contractors. Now, viewership on our website ranged from over 400 to over 1,500 in terms of the view. On days two to four, we had question and answer sessions, so these were live sessions where local entities were able to speak directly to the prime contractors to submit questions to them and really get those burning questions answered, you know, on opportunities, where, where opportunities would lie for them. One day after he announced that Guyana is expected to receive an additional 149,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccines under the African Union CARICOM Vaccine Agreement, Health Minister Dr. Frank Anthony has clarified that Guyana will have to pay for those vaccines. Guyana's doses are part of the 1.5 million doses promised to the Caribbean through an agreement with the African Union. During his daily COVID-19 update on Friday, the minister also said that through the agreement, Guyana will have access to the highly effective Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. President Irfan Ali has already said that Guyanese will not have to pay for the vaccines. In keeping with that promise, it is anticipated that the government will absorb the cost and not pass it on to citizens. These vaccines are not going to be free. Uh, they are vaccines that uh, the country would have to pay for. And right now, uh, we have indicated our interest in receiving vaccines through this mechanism and the details are currently being worked out between uh, CARICOM and the African Union. Uh, so as we get those details, we will uh, be able to update you. I think uh, it, they might have access to the mRNA vaccines, which would be Pfizer, Moderna, and uh, AstraZeneca vaccines. Still ahead on the newsroom, we feature a local sushi chef who's making the waves. The National Assembly on Thursday gave the nod for the amendment to the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act, which will increase the efficiency and effectiveness with which Parliament could consider the budget of constitutional agencies. But the amendment was passed amid rejections from the APNU AFC opposition since it repealed the 2015 amendment passed by the then coalition government. The People's Progressive Party Civic Government defended its decision to repeal a 2015 amendment to the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act, which saw the budget for constitutional agencies being sent to the National Assembly in advance of the submission of the rest of the national budget. Finance Minister Dr. Ashley Singh told the National Assembly that the amendment complicated the process for consideration of the national budget and also violated the underlying principle that the government is responsible for the spending of taxpayers' dollars. Dr. Singh has assured that the government's move to repeal the 2015 amendment will not affect the financial autonomy that the agencies enjoy. He said, with the government remaining answerable for the spending of taxpayers' money, then it must be allowed to interrogate the spending of the constitutional agencies through the Audit Office and the Ministry of Finance. Absolutely nothing in this bill will affect 
or influence the financial autonomy of these countries. And Mr. Speaker, with those words, with those words, with those, Mr. Speaker, I am repeat for emphasis, absolutely nothing in this bill affects the financial autonomy that is enjoyed by the, uh, the agencies listed in the third schedule of the Constitution. Dr. Singh, who opened the debate on the amendment in the House during the second reading of the bill, reasoned that if the underlining principle is to hold the executive accountable for public funds and fiscal outcomes, then it must have the authority to ensure accountability. The critical piece of legislation seeks to amend the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act, Chapter 7302. It will ensure that this House makes more infor better informed decisions. And ultimately, Mr. Speaker, we expect that it will ensure that, this that, that our country is better able to realize the fiscal outcomes uh, that we aspire to achieve. Arising from the 2015 amendment to the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act by a Partnership for National Unity and the Alliance for Change Coalition, constitutional agencies' budgets were required to be sent to the National Assembly in advance of the rest of the national budget. This two-stage process resulted in a fragmented and inefficient process for consideration of the national budget and denied the Parliament an opportunity to view and consider the budget in a comprehensive manner, Dr. Singh said. Members of Parliament from both sides of the House debated the amendment before it was put to a vote. The government side used its majority in the House to have the amendment pass. It comes as the government is preparing to present the 2021 national budget in the National Assembly within coming weeks. Despite the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the local food service industry, local chef Dustin Dalgetty has taken a bold step to launch his own sushi business. The Japanese delicacy is currently only offered at a few high-end restaurants in Guyana. Dalgetty, during an interview with the newsroom, explained why he chose to go dive into the business now. He also spoke about the challenges navigating the, no the novel dish in Guyana's food industry. to um, make an impact within the industry because uh, the industry in Ghana needs a lot of help in like on an international level. So a lot of people concern about sushi in the sense of is raw uh, but the rice is what is is called sushi rice. Um, this is a very starchy rice where it's uh, you have to wash it a few times so you could get out the star starchiness out of it and it's very sticky to like to use and to handle so you ha always have to keep your hands moist and you while using the rice um, when it's finished cooking like a cup of rice to a cup of water you can't put more you can't put less my first profession i'm a gym instructor and also a football coach but um what made me get into it is uh two young ladies <laughs> i must say um they encouraged me because when I used to live in London with my dad, we um, used to hold a lot of parties and stuff, and I used to do the cooking. And they said to me, Dustin, you can cook, so why you just don't, don't become a chef? Working with a few places like uh, Silhouette, Bistro, um, I did like Pegasus, Princess, a few places I work since, but always been doing my thing on the side. From there you take off, and it was uh, it was a big hit with the sushi, and you know a lot of. People were excited and wanted to try it and stuff.
lot of challenges because um, this times we don't get some of the ingredients in Guyana to do sushi. Um, like at the moment, there's no ingredients at the present time within the country until next week. So it's really challenging and hard when you don't have it when people would call to say um, they would like to order sushi today or tomorrow and then you would have to say man you don't have and so forth. The way I do my stuff I do it you know that I love the job I do so I do it because I, I love it and I put my all into it so um, I say the love that I put in my job is what makes it special, I think. To the COVID-19 pandemic, restrictions remain on travel in many parts of the world. And as such, Movie Town Guyana is bringing the city of love to you. With a miniature replica of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, along with a number of activities to show their loved ones just how much you appreciate them this Valentine's Day, the city of love is open daily from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. According to General Manager Rochelle Parshram, some of the attractions include how persons can have personal portraits done just for Valentine's Day and hand casting for couples and families. Fresh flowers are also available along with temporary tattoos, wine and cheese packages. At the City of Love, you will be sure to find something for a friend, family or even yourself. Movie Tongue's Cute Couple is also now open in addition with a number of grand prizes up for grabs. Town Guyana presents to you the City of Love, sponsored by KFC. So we want you to come on down and enjoy love in the atmosphere for this wonderful Valentine season from the 1st to the 14th of February. Experience love at Movie Town. We wanted to play on the idea that persons aren't able to travel, especially to the wonderful city of Paris. And so because of all of the different restrictions that we're facing right now, we decided to bring that beautiful city to our Guyanese people. So we decided to create our very own miniature replica of the Eiffel Tower. It's a beauty, isn't it? There's so many activities happening here at Movitown Guyana, especially at the City of Love. You can enjoy personal portraits, you can enjoy caricature portraits, also very unique to Guyana and very unique for this special occasion. We have available hand casting that can be done for couples or families. You can just come in, book an appointment or have it done right away. Also from Wine Cellar, we have wine and cheese available and she has some wonderful deals already packaged deals that you can just come by and pick up. Nisha's Flower Land is also here and she's offering a wide variety of fresh flowers uh, for the special occasion of Valentine's. So come on down, I'm sure you can find something for your loved ones here at Movie Town. Also, we have available personalized keychains that you can definitely use as a gift for your loved ones. So you have to check us out at the City of Love Movie Town. We have so many activities that are happening from the 1st to the 14th of February, every day, mall hours from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Well, not only you can come to Movie Town and enjoy this beautiful city of love and all the activities surrounding our Fiesta Plaza, but you also get an opportunity to win fantastic prizes. 
in our mall. Right now, we have a competition. It's called our Cute Couple Competition. And if you shop at any of our Movie Town stores, you have the opportunity to win one of 10 fabulous prizes. So our grand prize is a wonderful weekend staycation at Arrow Point Nature Resort. It's definitely an experience you don't want to miss. So you have the opportunity of winning that fabulous prize as our number one grand prize. Second prize, you have dinner for two at Jackson International Grill. They are ready and waiting to wine and dine that beautiful couple who will win that prize. Also our third prize, you have dinner for two at Cosmos. Now, Cosmos is one of our most amazing entertainment spot. So you have an opportunity now that we have indoor dining for Cosmos to give you that grand experience. So guys, you have so much to gain from coming down to Movie Town and enjoying the city of love and of course, have the mall shopping experience here at Movie Town. It's grand prizes. We have the live draw that's happening on the 1st of March. So stay tuned. You can definitely check out our social media pages for all details pertaining to our competition and of course, the city of love. Now that we have a few restrictions that are lifted and we have the opportunity to have indoor dining, you can definitely come to Movie Town and you can enjoy our seating atmosphere. It is all within our COVID-19 protocols. You can come, it's six feet apart, it's four per table. You can come in, sit down, enjoy the experience, have something to eat, or you can visit any of our wonderful restaurants to have that wonderful Valentine experience on the weekend of Valentine. We are here and we are loving this atmosphere, we are loving this experience and we want our Guyanese people to enjoy it also. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sport. Welcome back to Newsroom. Avinash Ashramson here with tonight's sport. We're starting off with some cricket news. The CG Insurance Super 50 Cup gets cracking this weekend in Antigua with a total of 19 matches to be played at two venues, the Coolidge Cricket Ground and the Sir Vivian Richards Stadium. A new champion will be crowned on February 27 as the last champions, West Indies emerging players, are not part of this year's competition. The six traditional cricket territories of the Caribbean will be battling for the Supply Lloyd Trophy. I'm joined by Ravindra Madolal, the Canada-based Guyanese cricket journalist, as we talk briefly about the Guyana Jaguars' chances and what we can expect in the Super 50 Cup over the next three weeks. Ravindra, Guyana has been without a title since 2005 when the Shivnarayan Chanda Paul led Guyana squad defeated Barbados in the KFC final. We were there at Borda, uh, Ravindra, as fresh faces in the media um, quite a long time ago. Is there any pressure on Leon Johnson and, and company this year to deliver a title, um, knowing the fact that they lost three finals since that last success? Well, you could say a little bit pressure on Leon Johnson, but, um, you know, 15 years ago, that's a long time, you know, hopefully they can end the drought, but a good opportunity for them to really create a good impression on this occasion. As you would have mentioned, Avinash, that um, yeah. the five traditional teams will be in action uh, because of the global uh, pandemic, understandably so, because in comparison to the last tournament, when you had 10 teams um, participating, but now we have uh, six teams vying for supremacy. So that will bring a great level of uh, competition. But I'm confident um, Leon Johnson can deliver on this occasion for Guyana. I mean, he has a good bunch of players uh, at his disposal. He has got good quality leadership. I mean, he would have done well or exceedingly well or exceptionally well for Guyana in the past recently because he would have led them to the 40 champion uh, on five occasions. So that demonstrated the level of captaincy that he has a very skillful, very clever captain, but now is a matter of going out there and perform to the best of their ability. Right. So uh, several leading uh, limited overs players are in the mix this season, West Indies players, of course, including Shimron Ketmaya for Ghana Jaguars. He last played in the tournament, the Super 50 tournament in 2018, and he's now back as the vice captain. How significant a role do you see him playing in this tournament, um, both as a mid-order batsman and leader of that pack, along with Leon Johnson? Well, I think Avinash, uh, you know, is a good question when it comes to a young or a brilliant yeah. talent. 
talented player like Sherman Etemayo. Now he has been given the vice captaincy role, a little bit of responsibility. I think he can mix it up a little. It's good for him and by extension yeah. West Indies cricket because he's such a flamboyant play- player in this version of the game. Uh, he can bring a, a good level of cricket here to for, for Guyana and ultimately help them to win the championship as we would have said that 15 years in succession doesn't resonate well for Guyana cricket. But Eddie Meyer, once he can be flamboyant, once he can be consistent, I think he can play a very, very important role for Guyana. Yeah, I think key word there is consistency from Shimron. That has been lacking, you know, in, in, in his career so far. As I mentioned, uh, several leading West Indies players, of course, available this season, including the white ball captain, Kieran Pollard, uh, test skipper, Jason Holder. Um, Hetmeyer and Nicholas Puran, two very good and exciting young batsmen. And Sunil Narayan, he's there as well. Is it safe to assume, Ravindra, that we can expect one of the most uh, competitive Super 5th tournaments here in recent times? Do you have the quality of players available? Undoubtedly, Avinash. I mean, when you have all these high players, uh, yeah. high profile players at your disposal or in a competition and a shortened competition, understandably so because of the global pandemic, you can expect a great level of, level of competition. You know, right. as you would have said that all these players are available, all these players are going to represent their respective country on in one competition. It's going to be support for them. It's going to be good for West Indies cricket. It's going to bring a great level of competition. And everyone definitely will be anxious to go out there and showcase their talent. So we can expect a great tournament um, in one country. Um, no doubt to say that um, each team will be vying for supremacy, but it's going to be real, real good competition. I'm glad to see all these players, um, right. you know, in, in one competition, as I would have said, it's uh, ultimately better for West Indies cricket. All right, so it, the, the format for this year is quite fast-paced. The short tournament, three weeks, wrong robin format with the top four advancing to the semi-finals. What do you think is key to nailing a top four spot? I mean, in, in my opinion, I feel that, you know, there is not much room for error because you, you need to be on point from ball one. I can agree with you totally, Abhinash, but consistency is very important. I mean, if you're going to play uh, positive uh, cricket from ball one, let's say for Guyana, they're going to open their campaign against the arch rival Barbados Pride. They need to win there. They need to be positive. They need to put up a good uh, show there. It when both departments of their game. The batting, if they're going to bat first, they need to get a formidable total in excess of 300. So that's going to show some sort of confidence in that area. Then if they're going to bowl first, they need to restrict Barbados Pride. But as we would have said, that it's competition going to be very high here, but they could go out and do it. Consistency from each and every participating participating team is of paramount importance here if they're going to come out successful. Right. And so you're back in the Ghana Jaguars to go all the way this season? Obviously, uh, I'm back in uh, Guyana Jaguars. I mean, as uh, we would have said that, they, you know, they want to end this drought. They have a good opportunity. They have a good bunch of players, uh, a mixture of youths and experience. Um, they, we have got uh, good uh, players with the, the right temperament for this one-day version. So I'm very, very optimistic they can bring back the title on this occasion. Provindra, thank you very much for your thoughts. Great, thank you. Continuing with our coverage this evening, Bangladesh have taken a 218-run lead into day four of the first test after Mahidi Hassan's 4 for 58 helped bundle West Indies out in dramatic fashion in Chittagong. The tourists, replying to Bangladesh's first innings total of 430, lost five wickets for six runs to collapse from 253 for five to 259 all out, incurring a deficit of 171 runs in the process. The slump undermined the effort put into the hard-fought day on which Craig Braffitt improved on his 49 to 76 and Jermaine Blackwood 68, Joshua De Silva 42 and Kyle Mears 40 all battled hard. But the loss of De Silva sparked panic in the West Indies camp with Hassan claiming the scalp of Blackwood. That wasn't the end of the wickets though as Bangladesh slipped to 1 for 2 then 33 for 3 in their second innings before reaching stumps on 47 for 3. And Joe Root marked his 100 test match with a commanding century, his third in as many games as England made an impressive start to the first test against India. The England captain hit a brilliant 128 not out in Chennai and led his side to 263 for three at the close. Root shared a stand of 200 with opener Dom Sibley, who ground out 87 from 286 balls before falling in the last over of the day. The late wicket boosted India, but a high-class partnership helped England recover from 63 for 2, having lost Rory Burns for 33 and Don Lawrence for a duck on the stroke 
of lunch. And Onrit Naki took five wickets as Pakistan were dismissed for 272 on day two of the second test. But South Africa's struggles with the bat in the subcontinent continued as they limped to 106 for four by stumps. Naki, 5 for 56, was superb with the ball, his aggression and accuracy leading to a third five wicket haul in test matches to restrict Pakistan to a manageable first innings score. The Ghana Motor Racing and Sports Club will host its first event for the year on February 28 with the return of drag racing at the South Dakota circuit. Akim Green reports. Initially, an endurance meet was to be held in January, but the habitation works on the track forced that to be postponed. The reason was due to the drag strip's launch pad being renovated, which will now offer drivers greater traction at a start and ideally faster times. However, while fans will be allowed entry, the definitive amount has not been decided upon as yet since the COVID-19 task force has to visit and approve that figure. GMRNSC President Ramiz Mohammed explained, open quote, It has been a long wait for the return of any form of racing in Guyana and what a fitting way to restart with drag racing. We are still ironing out some areas as regards how many fans we can allow in the venue and that will soon be made public. However, for those who cannot come, we have put systems in place to live stream the event so our loyal fans can still enjoy the thrills from the safety of their homes. End quote. It is understood the unstoppable team Mohammeds will bring out all three of their dominant GTRs. The improved developments done by Azadin Mohammed, owner of Team Mohammeds, especially that of the brand new launch pad and other enhancements, will allow for Team Mohammeds to target the seven second marker for all three of the beastly fast machines. In June 2019, Team Muhammad's white GTR shattered a drag racing record at South Dakota. The explosion of speed was recorded at 8.099 seconds on the clock in an unchallenged race to wipe out the previous record set by Goliath of 8.584 seconds, which was done in March 2019 on the new quarter mile strip. It is expected that ever improving Sean Prasad and his contingent of cars will try to pose a challenge. While it is still early days, the Trans-Pacific Altiza has not confirmed participation as yet. For the newsroom, Akim Green. And finally, the Athletics Association of Ghana will host its first development meet on February 14 at the synthetic track. And President Aubrey Hudson says there are still in discussions with coaches as to the best format it should take. Here again is Akim Green. Track and field action return as AG got necessary approvals to host the developmental meet which will feature all of Guyana's junior and senior elite athletes who are based in Guyana. However, given the length layoff due to the pandemic, Hudson indicated they are still not decided as yet on the format since the seniors have Olympic hopes would need to start pressing for times from now. Well, we, we are working with the coaches right now. Matter there is an active discussion that is ongoing. Um, as it relates to what kind of events we should have. Do we do the regular distances or do we do the odd distances? And then there's, there's the other suggestion that the athletes who are preparing, particularly for the Olympics, um, who must compete with our national seniors in April, should do regular distances because we would not have enough time to do odd distances and then go into regular distances. So that discussion is ongoing right now. So what you may necessarily see coming up next Sunday is uh, the younger athletes, those uh, the junior ones who are not eyeing the Olympics in, um, in particular, may be doing odd distances while the senior ones, Aki, the Akeem Stewart and the, and the um, Davin Fraser and those guys doing regular distances. Hudson said he expects an eager group who are hungry for competition. Yes, yes, because the athletes have been asking for competition and they would have watched other sports, um, particularly football, being played and, you know, continue to question why we were not having anything. But we want to reassure them that the only time that we will have competition is when um, we can assure ourselves that our events are not going to be uh, events where COVID-19 is being spread. So there, there's a lot of work that needs to go into that. Given there will be athletes coming from Linden and Burbies, the AG head said they've opted for one long day of competition and those who compete in early morning sessions can distance themselves afterwards. Only AAG officials, athletes, active coaches and members of the media will be allowed entry into the venue. For the newsroom, Akim Green. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. My name is Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for watching.